Merci. We're becoming programmable. Um, and it's every week I hear about a different app that allows you to plan your route through the city on some other criteria that has nothing to do with you know, what transportation modelers think people use to make their decisions, cost, speed, uh, mode. You know, there's apps that um, will let you have the highest calorie count burned if you're trying to be healthy or the lowest carbon output if you're trying to be sustainable. This is Amazon's you know, robot-powered fulfillment center. The workers don't go out to the stacks to get the stuff that you bought and put it in a box. The stacks come to them on top of a, a robot courier, and it's much more efficient. Um, if you haven't seen the videos of Kiva's warehouses or been to one, you should go do it immediately and just imagine it with no roof. And that's the city of the future that we're imagining <laughs> at night. Um, and this was, I think, the, probably the biggest headline from um, Beyond Traffic that I have recited over and over to both validate and draw people's attention to is that freight volume is growing faster than population, and it will continue to for the next century. From the developer point of view, um, if you're trying to create a walkable, dense, transit-oriented community, this is a problem that you have to deal with because it severely impacts quality of life. Um, you spent all this money to make a nice walkable place, and then it's clogged you know, all day long by pizza delivery trucks, um, you know, FedEx, uh, UPS, and, and whoever else is going to enter the market. What I think is really interesting now is there's, there's about a half dozen agent-based modeling exercises that have tried to look at these shared autonomous vehicle taxi services and like what the impacts of those could be on number of cars, on VMT, on peak congestion levels. Um, the OECD just published a very thorough one looking at Lisbon in Portugal. And the, you know, the conclusions are all pretty much in tune with each other, and they're stunning, you know, in terms of, of um, you know, the, the, the shift that could happen. Um, so I think that's the kind of thing that I'd like to see more of. Those models, though, like I look at them and, and you know, people, people who are advocates of shared mobility are like, we're going to get rid of 80% you know, of the cars with 5,000 shared taxis in Manhattan. And, you know, I look at it and say, that's great, but that's a Manhattan that only exists in your computer model. You know, like it's, it's, it's so simple, it's not the real world, right? Um, and again, there's no story about how we get from here to there, what the transitional states are. Um, so, but it's a great start. I mean, it's definitely saying that there's a lot of potential there and we need to study it and we need to like map out that transition and then try to like enable it, um, develop a, a plan to regulate it, to incentivize it, to invest in it, whatever needs to happen. Pretty much any story you can tell about the future falls into one of these four archetypes. It's either story about growth, which is kind of the world we're on, um, chugging into the future unimpeded. It's a collapse story where um, favorable conditions deteriorate, the price of oil, um, unstable climate, whatever it might be, and that causes some critical failures. Uh, it could be a constraint story um, in which um, there's a key resource that limits growth, and more often than not, um, you get a response from society to, to ration access to those resources, um, or a transformation story. This is really the kind of Silicon Valley narrative of disruptive change driven by high-tech innovation that allows us to grow even better with fewer externalities than before.